We have many, many problems as a country. None of those problems is going to be resolved unless we have a media infrastructure that tees up those issues, that digs for the facts, that tells people the truth about them, and then you trust in democracy that the voters will make a good decision for the future. Mr. Michael Topps, thank you very much. You are the former interim chair of FCC. And um, I'm interested to get your opinion since you have retired from FCC. So talk about your um, motivation to get involved with FCC and how did you end up over there? Well, I ended up at the uh, Federal Communications Commission. Uh, after leaving the Department of Commerce, uh, I was an Assistant Secretary of Commerce for uh, uh, most of the eight years of the Clinton administration. and. Uh, when a new president came in, I was looking for something else to do. I had worked in information technologies and uh, uh, internet from the standpoint of foreign trade and all of that, so I knew a little bit about it. And uh, there was an opening at the Federal Communications Commission for a Democratic seat, so uh, the Democrats uh, in the Senate uh, uh, sort of agreed that that would be me and recommended my appointment to the uh, president. Uh, he nominated me and then I was confirmed and I served for about ten and a half years as uh, uh, as a member of the Federal Communications Commission and uh, for about seven or eight months between the Bush and the uh, Obama administrations I was interim chair during the time of the famous, uh, luckily not infamous, digital television transition. But what was your motivation to get in? Were you part of, were, were you involved with media? Had you been a reporter or a journalist? No, I'm a historian. My motivation for getting is involved because I'm worried about the uh, news and information infrastructure and our media ecosystem in the United States. I think you have to have a really vibrant media to sustain the kind of citizen dialogue that you need to have, a civic dialogue, so that you have an informed electorate and people who are informed about the issues so they can make intelligent decisions for the future of the country. And I had watched already that the media industry was starting to consolidate, that fewer and fewer big media moguls were buying up formerly independent, family-run, local and diverse uh, stations, and that the public sector, the FCC, was actually blessing this uh, consolidation and was eliminating all of the public interest guidelines uh, that we once had to make sure that the public uh, airwaves served the public interest. So I knew that was going to be my issue when I got to the FCC and it remained my issue uh, throughout the decade I was there and when I retired at the end of 2011 I knew I didn't want to leave those issues behind because I have a passion for, for those issues. So I ended up at Common Cause starting a new media and democracy uh, reform initiative over there to start a grassroots uh, uh, movement in favor of democratic small d uh, media reform. Uh, an informed electorate is a prerequisite of self-government and if you don't, <coughs> don't have a media system that's informing the electorate, that's just shouting opinions at one another or where investigative reporting has been all but demolished and, and all you have is glitzy infotainment not all you have, but too much of what we have is just going to infotainment rather than news, spin rather than substance, opinion rather than fact. That's not a healthy diet for American democracy. Uh, American democracy cannot probably survive on that diet. So that's why I think it's so central. We have many, many problems as a country. None of those problems is going to be resolved unless we have a media infrastructure that tees up those issues that digs for the facts, that tells people the truth about them, and then you trust in democracy that the voters will make a good decision for the future. But you really have to have that vibrant media, and we do not have it in too many instances right now. So is that why media matters? You bet media matters. Media matters to democracy. Media matters to reform. We're not going to get reform of democracy, change in democracy, the things that democracy needs to keep on growing in this diverse economy unless you have media reform first. Now, you attended all the National Media Reform Conference that have been put together by uh, Free uh, Press. Yes, I did. For, I, I believe they have had like eight of them. because they No, could. they've had uh, uh, this was either the fifth or sixth that we just had. Yeah, from 2003 to right now. Am I right? Yeah, they're starting. 
and it was trivials. But uh, I want to get your experience. I you think had... the first one was in 2005, 2005, 2007, 2009, 2000. Yeah, this was the fifth one. First one was in Madison, Wisconsin in 2005. Yes. I was there. Yes, uh, and I have seen you. I have attended some All of right. those. I, I skipped two. I've been to every one. Yes, I want to. I want to see. Um, talk about the importance of that, and talk about your contribution to media reform conferences, and what's your take from them. Well, my take is that there's a lot of people around the country, uh, young folks and uh, older folks too, who really understand that something is amiss in our media infrastructure. I think for a long time people just thought, well, that's just a theory. Where are all of these harms from consolidation and where, where's the damage? Now I think people are beginning to palpably feel it. They know that they're paying too much for a two-week uh, two broadband diet. They know that there are gatekeepers trying to shut off access to, uh, to, uh, to, the, to the Internet. They know there are cable bills. That are, they know the broadcasters are are making so much money in all these unaccounted, uh, unaccountable political ads. So people, there's a, there's a certain churning out there in favor of reform right now. And what I saw at the last media conference in Denver just a few weeks ago was people reporting exactly that to me, that there's a feeling. People now feel the hurt from what we have been talking about was going to come, and now it's come and they're feeling it. So I think we have a moment now when we can do something, but it's going to require really concerted citizen action because there are huge special interests on the other side. There are piles of money on the other side, armies of lobbyists and special interests. But in the final analysis in democracy, the people, when they speak, if they speak, can still make the difference and they can overcome that money. But it takes one heck of a concerted effort, and that's what I'm trying to be part of. That's what Free Press is trying to be part of with the uh, media reform conferences was common cause is trying to be and the people that are gathered here today at this uh, California media reform conference. So I really like the idea that you're bringing up civic society, education, democracy and media. Can you connect those two to, those four together? You, you can't disconnect them together. They're all they're all interdependent upon one another. We have to have in this new age of media that we have now you have to have digital literacy or new literacy or media literacy how to uh, use the tools of the new age, but also an understanding in the part of young people how they can be misused by those tools and how do they differentiate a reliable source from an unreliable source or a fact from an opinion. So you need that, uh, uh, you need that literacy. You need the media reform to bring the people's airways back to uh, serving the public interest of the people. You have to stop the, put the brakes on all of this consolidation uh, uh, that we've had before. And none of the other problems facing the country are going to be resolved until media gives them the attention that they deserve, whether it's the economy or health or the environment or energy or opening the doors of equal opportunity. We have all of these wonderful new technology tools now, but we're letting them go down the wrong road. So what you see now is broadband and the Internet, which we're going to be forever free. Oh, nobody can ever interfere with those. Not so. They're just like any other communications infrastructure we've ever had. You're going to have people who are trying to corner markets and capture markets and, and charge what they can. And that's normal to capitalism. I mean, that's not going to change. But what we have to do is reassert public policy. Where does public policy come in to control that? Where do you put the brakes on, on that so that the public interest is served? And it's not just the public interest as some theoretical concept. It's democracy. It's our ability to cast intelligent votes for the future. So it's all bound up. All these things are bound up together. So uh, you talk about, in your talk today as well, and right now you spoke of policy. Could you elaborate on that policy? Does that mean that like somebody would w write something, a law, and just slip it in and would p get we passed? Already, we already have plenty of laws to do a lot of the things I want to do. The FCC, on purpose over the last generation, has eliminated eliminated most of the public interest guidelines that we once had for broadcasters. Are you going out and talking to people in your community about the kind of issues that you want covered, the programs you want to see? Are you reflecting the diversity of your community? Are you giving people access to public affairs programming, cultural programming, diversity programming? The FCC could be back in that business tomorrow morning. You don't have to change any law. You don't have to have any new proposals. 
So it's not to see, this is a very difficult time to pass progressive legislation, as you know, with the Congress that we've got uh, right now. But the fact is that we do have some of these tools already, and I think as a good down payment on democracy reform and, and media reform, we ought to be doing some of those things. We ought to be saying to the broadcast licensee, for example, we're not going to just let you go eight years like we have for the last few years between license renewals and all you got to do is send in a postcard. We want you to tell us what you've been doing for the last three years. Let's do this every three years. What have you been doing to serve the public interest? Are you putting more emphasis in the news and information, diversity of your culture, of your community, the cultures uh, of our community? Those are all things that we could do right now. The FCC has the authority right now to demand fuller disclosure of who's bringing us all of these god-awful political ads that we all had to endure during the 2012 election cycle. You know, that ad that says brought to you by Mothers for uh, Apple Pie and, and, and the Red, White, and Blue Flag, and you don't know who that is. There's a law on the books already, and it's been there for 50 or 60 years, that empowers the FCC to demand deeper disclosure than that. All we need to do is up, update the rule that's already in the books. You could do that in 90 or 120 days. By the time the election of 2014 came around, people would have a better idea. They would know who was bringing them those ads and who's trying to buy their vote. So there's lots we can do right now, but it's going to take people <coughs> telling their leaders that that's what they want to happen. So as you know, the owner of the medias <coughs> are not living in the <coughs> community that they, uh, they own the media. That's right. And so how is it that people on the ground in, in their community <coughs> would have a say in the postcard um, uh, processing that to renew them? How, how can people have a, a, a way of well, saying? Well, they make their interest known. They make it known to the FCC. They make it known to their leaders and to their congressional representatives. When the congressman or the senator comes home and has a town hall meeting, you go out and say, hey, something's wrong with our media here. I, I, I saw this happen, for example, when Michael Powell tried to loosen the media ownership rules. And we took that issue to the country, and three million people spoke up, and those senators and congressmen heard them, and they turned those rules around. So we know that democracy can still work and that the people can still speak. So there's plenty of ways, I think, that, uh, that people can be a part of it. But you got, there's no silver bullet. You start out, you talk to your family, you talk to your friends, your colleagues. You, uh, if you can write a letter to the editor, write a letter to the editor. If you can sing a song about it, sing a song about it. If you can lead a march, lead a march. Just citizen action. All of those actions that over the course of American history have stimulated reform, the real reform that matters, that comes not as a gift from Washington to the people, but from the people up because they demand it. So I think I have one or two more questions. That's one it. More. And one more. <laughs> Thank you. And then, uh, so you talk about the internet, something that was uh, initiated here in the United States. Right. But, but right now in Japan, Korea, they get a bigger broadband sure. and cheaper fees for having access to them. Even our cell phones that we use here right. are more expensive for using the towers than what it is in the countries that they just use in them. Right. What have you say about this? We blessed monopoly in this country, and uh, countries overseas blessed competition and encouraged competition, wholesale access to, uh, to the fiber so that would be competition for services, structural separation for these companies uh, so that there's a little distance between uh, the part that's doing uh, uh, the access and the part that's doing the, the actual service. Uh, we threw away the possibility, maybe we can still get some of it back, I hope so. We have to have competition. That's what keep prices, keeps prices down. When I first went to the Commission back in 2001, we were arguably one, two, or three in the world in terms of getting broadband out to all of our citizens. Now we're, according to the OECD, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, number 15. Others put us even lower than that. That make any difference to me if it's 12, 15 or 50th, your country and mine needs to be in the vanguard. And as you say, we invented it here, we devised it here, so why is it that we're, we even tolerate this kind of low calorie broadband that we have? Uh, not many homes have the fiber. The cell service is far from being the, the greatest in the world. We've got a long way to go, but that takes a national mission. And, and even the FCC alone uh, can't fix that. that takes a true private sector, public sector partnership. Just how we always built infrastructure in this country, how we built roads and bridges and harbors and railroads and 
highways and rural electricity and even plain old telephone service. Private sector leading the way and, and uh, all of that, but guided by some sense of vision where we're going. Now we all know that the needed infrastructure of the 21st century is high-speed broadband. And to me, as a civil right, I think if you, if you don't have if you don't have that access to high-speed broadband, you're not going to get a job. You're not going to open the doors of equal opportunity. You're not going to be able to educate yourselves. So it's, the, it's that important. But that takes real leadership. And all we hear about is budget deficits, budget deficits, budget deficits, and we can't do anything. But goodness, that's, that's the essential investment for the country if we're going to dig ourselves out of the hole we're in. Well, thank you very much, and if you want to add anything, the floor is yours. Okay. No, I just appreciate it. I always appreciate you guys covering the issue, and uh, that's what it takes to get the, get the information out there and uh, get people energized, and they ought to be energized. Thank you again. All right. Good.